If God exists, I'm told, then God is the creator. Creation is God's glory. Creating is God's essence. I've heard this so often, and for so long, it seems to make sense. But does it make sense? I almost believe in God, and I want to know about God. Which is why I ask, what does it mean for God to be the creator? Does a creator God work? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Here's my plan. I will assume that God exists, although I'm not at all sure, so that I can explore how God would work as creator. God is theology. Creation is science. That's why I begin at Oxford with Alistair McGrath, who has two PhDs in biophysics and in divinity. Now at King's College, Alistair calls his specialty scientific theology. Alistair, how, in your worldview, is God the creator? Well, I think that the key idea in, in talking about God as creator is, first of all, that, that the world did not come into existence of its own accord, but in some way it was brought into being. And that leads us into the, the second major point, which is that in some way the act of creation impresses upon the, the creation itself, the imprint or the likeness of the one who made it. We might think, for example, of an artist who, who does a painting or a sculptor or indeed a writer, that there is something of the creator embedded in the work of creation. And so that immediately gives us a whole new way of looking at nature. It's not sufficient in itself. It's almost like a signpost saying, look, this is good, but I'm pointing to something that lies beyond me, which is even better. Modern cosmology is saying to us, look, it's almost as if the world seems to have come into existence with the laws of nature embedded within it. Where did they come from? If science is pointing this direction but can't give us the answers, is there any other way in which what science intimates but can't prove can be known by other means? I think many scientists, and I'll, I will use Einstein since he can't defend himself at this point, that his view is more of, of, a, of an implicit order, of a level of regularity, of comprehensibility. I don't think he had a personal God in, in his worldview. He certainly didn't have a personal God in his worldview, but he is intrigued by the idea of order. Yes. Now, I'd want to, in fact, turn that the other way around and say, why is that ordering there? Is there a bigger way of looking at the world that allows us to count for both the ordering of the world and the capacity of the human mind to identify and represent this order? Now again, for me, I find an answer in the Christian doctrine of creation. The order of the universe and the capacity of the human mind to comprehend that order that, according to Alistair, is the imprint of the Creator God, the unique style of the master artist. Its standard religious rationale and science offers other explanations. But I am trying to track God, assess God's characteristics, eye God's contradictions, see if anything's there. So why would God, if God is perfect, want or need to create the universe. In Oxford, I visit the former Regis Professor of Divinity, philosopher, theologian, Keith Ward. Traditionally, right, the medieval great tradition uh, has been to say that creation doesn't change God at all. So God remains being perfect, unchanged by creation, but creation, as it were, flows out from God for its own sake without changing God in any way. And so the reason for creation on that sort of view, as put by Thomas Aquinas, for example, is that good, goodness naturally shares itself, but without changing or being changed. But there's a view which has sprung up more recently that creation 
does change God, uh, and that in creating God is willing there to be a community of uh, fellowship, friendship, love between different persons. So relationship now becomes a very important part of creation and you might say for this view the reason for creating is that relationships should exist. So how did God do that? I mean there are what one would seem infinite possibilities of different ways to achieve this. Traditionally all possibilities exist in the mind of God that's part of omniscience and that God knows everything so God knows everything that's possible and uh, so I think all possible worlds uh, exist in God's mind with this caveat that there might not be an actual set of all possible worlds. It might be the case that, um, although it sounds strange at first, possibilities only exist when God conceives them. And that's a much more active view of possibility. And this would be a strong sense of possibility being dependent upon a conceiving mind. It would be rather like the mathematical difference between people who say mathematical truths are out there uh, and other people who say they're constructed in some way. Well, either way, uh, not you have all, a lot of them. Uh, you way. have a lot of them. You have a lot of them. And God's not going to create all of them. Some of them are too terrible uh, for God, who has any reasonable um, compassion, to create. <laughs> so you say, which possible worlds would God create? I suppose God would create universes which contain distinctive sorts of value of goodness, which couldn't exist in any other sort of universe. And a lot of universes would be like that. <laughs> and if you ask me how many worlds God would actualize, well, I see no reason why God shouldn't create more than one universe, more than one cosmos, more than one space-time. Or there might be just the one. It'd be difficult to decide that. What I wouldn't think very convincing is that God has to create, necessarily, the best of all possible universes. Uh, I think all I'd be prepared to say uh, is that God, any universe that God does create must contain distinctive goods which vastly outweigh any evils that exist. So that's the condition. God, by nature, creates universes. Here's Keith's story. The reason why God created the universe is to have relationships among persons. So, supposedly, this is how God made it all. First, by considering all possible worlds, and then by selecting one or more worlds based on value, the totality of net goodness generated. Personally, I cannot conceive how God could conceive all possible worlds. But last I checked, I'm not God. I am bothered. In imagining a creator, are we imputing to God traits of ourselves, making God in our own human image while claiming that God made humans in God's image? I ask a theological thinker who does not worry about humanizing God, the intellectual leader of the controversial intelligent design movement, William Dembski. I'm not so worried about anthropomorphism. It seems that if we are, in fact, the crown of creation, if we are made in the image of God, then in a sense, by looking inside ourselves, our own creativity, we can get some insight into God's creative activity. When you think of that then, what you find is that, in a sense, creative activity in acting by intelligence becomes the fundamental mode of causation because God, by a spoken word, brings the world into being, you know, and then that world takes on a determinate character where physical laws seem to operate. So in a sense, those are derivative, you know, and I think uh, the uh, materialistic evolutionist turns that on its head. It's that material processes are fundamental and then intelligence is this evolutionary byproduct. We can look outside, we can look within. And uh, it seems that we can get some legitimate insights into divine creativity just by the nature of our own right. creativity. So, 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 so to do some of that, what can we then infer to how that might work with well, God? I mean, I think we ourselves are designers, engineers. We engineer things. We look inside the cell. We find that the cell has all sorts of signal transduction circuitry, information processing, storage retrieval control. And we say, well, uh, 
there's a designer behind it, then that designer is a consummate nano engineer. How is it that the, the information, the structures, the patterns that are required for life and for the, the, the world to come about, it seems that uh, you know, God has to be working in the world to, to bring these things about. And uh, I, I do see a place for, for evolution, you know, where, where God is bringing things about by an evolutionary process. I would see it as an imminent God working in nature, but bringing about purposes. You don't like the word supernatural to describe a miracle. Why? Well, it, it seems to me what, what supernatural does, it's, uh, it, it, as it were, gives the naturalist or the materialist, says, you know, we're going to grant you that you know, you've got the right conception of nature and then God sort of gets in there on top of it. And there's this sort of suspect realm of the, the supernatural which gets laid over it. And it seems to me that rather uh, n the natural order or material world is itself uh, an incomplete characterization of reality. The uncontroversial reality is, is a much richer reality than the material world, which allows for miracles. There are lots of ways God can get his hands in there if he wants to. Bill is not embarrassed by an anthropomorphic creator God, a transcendent being who seems too much like human beings. Rather, Bill sees human creativity as a hint and shadow of God's creativity. To Bill, God and God's miracles are not supernatural, in that God is not laid over a natural reality. Rather, God infuses a much richer reality. Bill is bold, give him that. But Bill's God is the biblical God of Christianity and Judaism. Why should the Bible dictate how a creator might work? What about the Hindu God as creator? I ask Hindu physicist V. V. Raman. In the Hindu world, there is a hymn, the so-called hymn of creation. And it begins by saying that initially there was nothing, not even light, not even darkness, no water, no ground, and so on. But what is interesting is that in the end, even though the sage poet who reflects on creation says that the whole universe was born out of desire, in the end, there is a reflection to the effect, who knows whence and how the universe arose? Maybe only the God, gods know, or even they do not. <laughs> as far as I know, this is the only doctrine of creation in any religion where there is a touch of skepticism <laughs> recognizing that this is a grand mystery. And I have always been impressed by that because to me, it is the experience of mystery that constitutes real religion, the real religious experience. As soon as we give answers, they become the doctrines of religions. So how does this image of God in Hinduism enable creation to occur? In one vision, the universe, or God, if you want to use the word, was somewhat uh, bored with eternity, where there was nothing and nothing was happening. And in order to cut that boredom, the divine began this work of creation. And so that the universe may be looked upon as a doodling, <laughs> as it were, in space and time of divinity. In the Hindu world, one of the key ideas is that the universe, the macrocosm, is, uh, has its reflection in the microcosm. So our bodies and our uh, ways of looking at th these are reflections, in a way, of the larger cosmos or the cosmic consciousness. It seems to me when we hear in the Abrahamic tradition that man was created in the image of God, mm. uh, that more or less expresses the same idea that there are commonalities between us as human beings and the, the uh, cosmic uh, principle. The doodling of the divine 
Is this the grand mystery of creation? I see similarities between the Hindu and biblical creation stories, cross-cultural confirmations of God, or common myths of human fantasies. But if a real creator God really exists, how did such a God actually do the creating? I ask Christian philosopher William Lane Craig. Bill has made it his mission to discern how a creator God works. Bill, what does it mean for God to have created the world from nothing? I think we can understand this doctrine by differentiating, as Aristotle did, between types of causes. Aristotle said that one type of cause is what he called an efficient cause. This would be the cause that produces the effect in being. The material cause, said Aristotle, is the stuff out of which the effect is made. Now the doctrine of creation states that God is the efficient cause of everything exterior to himself and that there is no material cause out of which these entities were made. That God has created all the matter and energy in the universe, space and time themselves, without any material substratum, out of nothing. So let's layer on this the latest thinking in cosmology, which brings everything back to a point in time in which there is violent energy from which everything later develops. Yes. So what you're saying is that God somehow placed that there or? Yes, that he produced it, he, he brought it into being. One of the most exciting aspects of this doctrine of creation is that although it was denied by ancient Greek philosophy uh, and denied by modern enlightenment materialism and idealism, this doctrine finally in the 20th century has received dramatic scientific confirmation through astrophysical cosmology, which says that if you go back into the past, space shrinks down and finally comes to a boundary before which nothing existed, that space and time are finite in the past. And this has been rigorously demonstrated to be the beginning of the universe. And this is confirmatory of the doctrine of creation, which says that God has brought everything into being out of nothing. As I was speaking with Bill about God creating the universe, I recalled my long ago musings about the first verse in the Hebrew Bible. If there are any truth in the biblical account of creation, Genesis 1-1 had a story to tell. I remembered engaging a leading biblical scholar, my lifelong friend, James Tabor. There's a very deeply embedded misunderstanding that has led to all sorts of uh, misconstruings, really, of what the Hebrew Bible says. Genesis 1-1, many people can quote it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On one side is God who's not created. On the other side is everything that's created. That's just fundamental everything to all of Western there. religion. Right. That first word, in the beginning, is a temporal phrase. Here's how I would translate it. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. It's as if to say, we look at the moon, it's full of craters and pockmarks. And if I was God, say, when James began to refashion the moon, it was a real mess, you see? Yeah. Now, if that text is not really proposing a creation out of nothing, philosophically, it changes everything. So in the beginning, those three words are probably the most misunderstood words in the mm -hmm. Bible when mm -hmm. you think about it. It all depends on the word create, bara in Hebrew, which really does and can mean to fashion or form or shape. You have this chaos and void and you bring order out of chaos and void. God the creator would be seen as a, a, a kind of organizing force within the cosmos. 
But the cosmos itself and God could simply be forever. It takes away this notion of the temporal versus the eternal and simply starts with what is. This idea that God knows and determines. I'd had my own interpretation of Genesis 1-1, but first I should ask Bill Craig his. There is one statement, one verse, that speaks strongly to the subject of God's creation, Genesis 1-1. And if I can remember my Hebrew, it's Bereshit uh, bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. And the words mean, at least literally, beginning, create God, heavens and earth. Yes. Now that's the, the semantic meaning. Tell me what it really means. All right. <laughs> The expression uh, Hashemayim wa'et hararetz is an idiom in Hebrew for the whole universe. The there heavens no, and earth. Exactly, it means the heavens and the earth. There is no word in Hebrew for the universe. So in effect, verse one says, in the beginning, God created the universe. And I think this speaks of the absolute creation of the universe by God that is investigated by modern cosmology. And then in the second verse, the focus dramatically narrows now, and it says, and the earth was without form and void. So the first verse speaks of God's creation of the cosmos, and then from verse two on, it's speaking of how God turns the earth from an uninhabitable wasteland into a habitable environment for man. For some time until at least recently, a number of biblical exegetes or scholars attempted to construe verse one as a subordinate clause. When God created the world in the beginning, the earth was without form and void and so forth. But I think that this view has now been widely uh, rejected and undermined so that in fact, this isn't a subordinate clause construction. It is, a, it is a main clause followed by a conjunction. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in Hebrew, it says, and the earth was without form and void. The first verse, in a sense, stands outside of the typical ancient Near Eastern creation narratives. In these ancient Near Eastern creation myths, they typically have the form of, of saying, when such and such was the case, then God did blank. What the author of Genesis does is prefix to this traditional mythical formula, verse one, as an absolute and independent clause, in the beginning God created the universe. Two questions embrace the universe, creation, and God. One, did the universe have a beginning? Two, does God exist? The two questions yield four possibilities. One, the universe had a beginning and God does not exist. Natural law generates something from nothing. Two, the universe had no beginning and God does not exist. The universe itself self exists forever. Three, the universe had no beginning and God does exist. God is the reason and the sustainer. Four, the universe had a beginning and God does exist. God is the creator. Modern cosmology favors a real beginning, but God, no God, opinions are sharply split. But some say we cannot even ask about cosmic cause. According to philosopher Hubert Dreyfus, It's a wrong sort of question because you take the question about how particular things get caused in the world, and then you think somehow that the world can be treated like a thing, and you can ask and how this big thing called the world got created. For Kant, that's a mistake of the use of reason outside the bounds where reason can give us any answer or any information. Hey, it's a philosophical, rational mistake to ask the question about the creation of the universe. I disagree, and I will not stop probing the creation of the universe. That's why I'm on Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. <laughs>
Did God create the heavens and the earth from nothing? Going further, is more hidden here. The B in Bereshit, the Hebrew word for beginning, can also be translated with, with a beginning, in other words, with time. Did God create the heavens and the earth from nothing and with time? Creation is critical, coming closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>